Okay, welcome everybody. We're glad that you came to Pi, Ohio. Um, we're having uh, Eric Appelt, who's going to be talking about uh, co concurrency and coroutines. So if you didn't know all about it before, he'll tell you everything you need to know, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, thank you to Pi, Ohio for giving me the opportunity uh, to talk about concurrency and coroutines. Sorry. All right. Um, I'd also like to thank my mentors who have been teaching me an intensive course in concurrency for the last two and a half years, Jacob and Sophia. They're great. Uh, they can be very tough instructors, but they're loving and fair, so it's good. Um, okay, so uh, let me go start with the setup for this uh, tutorial, an outline of how this should go, what, what we're doing, and the expectations, and then we'll do some warm-up exercises. Um, with the one thing you need, basically, this is a coroutines are, are a new feature, but a core, fe a core feature of the language. So all you really need is Python itself and a terminal to, uh, to type in. Uh, but it needs to be at least Python 3.5 because any earlier version of Python um, does, not have, uh, does not have the coroutines and the syntax that we'll be using. Um, there's two third-party libraries that you can just pip install. One is requests. I think it's uh, pretty commonly used. The other is AIO HTTP, so you can just pip install both of those. If you're unable to install both of those, you could still follow along with, I'd say, approximately 60% of what we'll do. Uh, there'll be a little bit where you'll need to connect to the web. Uh, there's a repository for this tutorial uh, on my GitHub account that's spelled A-P-P-E-L-T-E-L, -E -E uh, coroutine tutorial. Uh, in the examples directory, all the, the codes that we'll type out together are there. You don't have to check it out, uh, but you can if you want to save yourself some typing or you just don't want to type a lot, <laughs> um, you can, and, and you can use these. I've printed it out, so I'll be using it as a cheat sheet. So, um, Any questions so far? Are we good? If I'm going too fast, if I talk too fast, if I type too fast, uh, please feel free to let me know and also if I'm failing to speak in the microphone. Um, so here's the, we'll do a little warm up with something I call the Animals API just to, to frame uh, what we'll, uh, the, the example that we'll use to show how you can really use concurrency. Um, uh, and then I have a metaphor for concurrency. That part will be more like just a mini talk. I wanted to make it interactive where everyone would cook something, but I don't think the fire marshal, I don't think that would work well. Uh, with then it'd be expensive too, um, and so then we'll uh, we'll actually do some running of coroutines by hand. That's not something you normally do with Python. You usually have a scheduler to run for you. But in order to understand the syntax and what Python actually does, I think it's helpful to really just just run them run a couple by hand, um, and then we'll go through the uh, uh, the scheduler that comes with Python, which is called AsyncIO, um, and then uh, I'll use we'll use the AIO HTTP library. Um, put uh, write a client, write a concurrent web server, and then if there's time, do some cool stuff with streaming, web connections, and publish and subscribe. Okay, um, the other thing is I meant to bring a CNSA. I don't know if everyone's familiar with the CNSA. This is a piece of hardware. You pull the cord, and the arrow goes around, and it tells you what the animal says. So, example, if it lands on the cow, it will tell you that the cow says moo. So if you're a business and you need to know what the animals say, this is an important piece of hardware. Um, but being a piece of physical hardware, you can run into problems. Like, for example, I left mine in the hotel, so I don't have it here to show you. Um, and, uh, and then if you own one for your business, you have to, uh, you need to hire an operator to make sure it has batteries to pull the cord for you. Um, and so I've offered an enterprise cloud solution to determine what the animals say. So, and, and you can compare this to having this on-premise solution is that with, the, with my solution, there's no capital expenditure requirement. We have capacity billing, so you, know, you pay as you go. It was a very easy to use RESTful web service API. And let's just do something as an example. So let's get out the terminal um, and just run Python. Um, now for this, I do, we do need the requests library. Does everyone have requests? Oh yeah, lots of nodding. So I'm going to import. Hey, 
And then let's just do um, type in my name, animals, and then cow. And this should return to us. Oops. It takes a while. You have to. Uh, you have to pull the. You have to. The cord has to be pulled and it has to go around. Okay, so I messed up. I forgot to assign the response. So I'm going to have to do it again. Ah, good call. Okay, so, yeah, so we can. Um, access uh, in the in the uh, Python REPL, you can access the previous return value with underscore variable. So now we have the response. And what I want is the text of that response, which is moo. So there you go. So you could try this with your own animals. Um, It's moo. Yeah, the cow generally says moo. <laughs> um, okay. So, let's make an example application. Given a list of animals, we'll connect to the animals API to get the animal sound. For each animal, we'll say the x says y, where x is the animal and y is the sound. And what I want to do is uh, structure it so there's a subroutine, a function, that retrieves and prints a given animal. And we'll just call that function over and over for each animal. So, so I'm going to make a module called animals.py. PY. So first thing we need to do is import requests. Um, to make my life easier, I'm going to uh, make a uh, constant string for the uh, base URL. Okay, um, now I'll make a function which will fetch what an animal says and return it. So I'll call this function speak. It will take as an argument the name of an animal. And I'm going to give it a request session object. So what I need to do is just uh, get the animal. So I'll do a format string. I'll construct a string from uh, the base URL. and the animal. And let's go ahead and throw an exception if you get a bad, if you, uh, if we get a bad status. So if the animal doesn't exist in my database or my virtual speak and spay, say, then uh, this will throw, this will raise an exception. Okay. And then the text of that will be our animal sound. So I simply return a string that says the animal says whatever sound we got. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and run it, test this function. The way I'll do it is with the Python dash i that will load up the module, will actually run the module and then dump me into an interactive uh, loop. And I can uh, make a session. Oops.
Okay, that works. Let me go back to the code, so if you're still writing it. Okay, now I want a main routine that calls this. And this main routine will have a list of animals. Um, I'm going to do a cow, a pig, and a chicken. We'll make a session object. And then I'll loop over my list of animals. For each one, I will call the speak function and pass it the name of my animal and my session object. And then I'll just print it. And at the end of this, I'll just, uh, I'll just have this run the main function. And while everyone's typing, uh, the point, this is, uh, actually, I, I better not say anything. Okay, can I go ahead and run it? Shake my head if you're not ready. Shake it. Yeah, okay, give it another minute. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and try it. Um, if you if you still want to bring it up, it's uh, it's in the repository under examples, and you, you can look at it while we're doing this. There we go. The cow says moo. The pig says oink. And the chicken says clock. Yes. Why is there such a lag? That's actually OK. So the real reason, the pretend reason, is it takes a while for the speak and say. The real reason is this is a web service that just takes some time. And you can imagine um, if, you're, if you're making a call to some database, you know, you may make that network call, and then the database just takes two or three seconds to process the query and get back to you. And, and this is basically a simulation of that in just sort of a silly way, right? Um, I'm pretending on my web server there's just a sleep. But um, you can imagine a web service where it takes a couple seconds to get back. And the important thing is us on the client side, we're not doing anything but waiting, right? We're wasting time. The server's actually doing some work. And, and that's, that's kind of the key point here. Um, Oops. Okay, did, did that work for everyone? I'll put this up here for a second. Um, any other questions? Okay. So yeah, this was, this was clearly slow and it takes a little bit of time to get each one. It'd be nice to fetch them all at the same time. And that's, a, that's ultimately what we'll do. 
But now for something completely different. Um, I want to talk about cooking with coroutines. And then we'll come back to actually using coroutines because coroutines, I think, are very much like using recipes in cooking. Um, I would like to talk about a very simple recipe that I make after work when I don't have much time to cook and the family is hungry. Uh, this first recipe is orange ginger salmon. By the way, if I fail at this tutorial and you learn nothing about how to use coroutines, you'll at least have a nutritious meal that you can make. So it won't be a complete waste of your time either way. So I preheat the oven to 350 degrees. You just put the salmon fillets on a cooking sheet. You take this orange ginger dressing I've, that they sell at my grocery store, put about two tablespoons on each one, and you throw it in the oven and bake it for 18 minutes. That's it. With that, I have the boxed rice peel off. This is good stuff too. All you have to do is put about a, a cup and three quarters water and two tablespoons butter in a two quart pot, bring it to a boil, then you stir in the spice package, it's all pre-done for you, and the rice pilaf cover, set, the, set it to low, you let it simmer for 25 minutes, and then you fluff it with the fork and let it stand for five minutes, and it's good to go. And this is my favorite, the steaming bag green beans. To make these, you take a fork and you poke holes in the bag. And then you put it on a microwave safe plate and you microwave for five minutes. And then voila, dinner in about 35 minutes. And this is great. And the best thing about it is most of that 35 minutes, I'm not doing anything, right? I mean, I can do something else while all these things are cooking. You know, I don't have to just stare at the oven and wait for it. And so, you know, with the kids, I can go play with them if I'm feeling like Super Dad or if I'm worn out, you know, maybe we'll put in an episode of Paw Patrol. Uh, so. But this is Python, so let's talk about automation and what would happen if we tried to automate dinner. I want to reimagine these recipes as if they were Python functions. So here's our orange ginger salmon. We need a sleep function from time. And from the kitchen module, we'll just import all the stuff, the food and tools we need, the oven, the baking sheet, the salmon, and the orange dressing. We have our cooked salmon routine. It preheats the oven. You see it sleeps for 18 minutes. Um, it, and, and then at the end, it, it returns everything that was in the oven. Here's a recipe for rice pilaf. Again, Python is batteries included. Everything's in the standard uh, library. Um, and again, there's lots of, if you notice, there's just lots of waiting around. Sleep for 22 minutes, sleep for five minutes. And here's a recipe for my favorite, the green beans. Um, you just call poke on the green beans, insert them in the microwave, call this cook function, and then extract, return what the result of extracting all of it. Okay, then we could put it all together in one function called make salmon dinner. Meat equals cook fish, starch equals cook rice, veggie equals cook beans, and we return a tuple of meat, starch, and veggies which you can then eat. Okay, and what's great about functions and ordering and encapsulation, the details of cooking a fish are encapsulated in that function, right? When you call a function, all that really matters, aside from some side effects, is what you pass to it and what is returned. It doesn't matter who called it. Um, we can make new dinners by switching out different recipes. This is all very nice. Um, and one thing about programming and function, I don't think, I think this is so, um, this has be some, become so ingrained, the, the use of functions to organize code, that it's easy to forget just how much simplicity that buys you. And that I can imagine going through the code with a stack of note cards. And when I start reading a function, I write down that function, what I pass to it, and start writing down the note card what the function's doing. And I put that on the table. And when that function calls another function, I just pick up another note card. I write down what parameters it has, and I start working through that function. And when it returns, I would just take that code card away and go to the one below it. And so you can imagine making a stack of note cards with these function calls. And you can understand the order of the code and the order of execution very well. Um, 
And so when you start talking about doing diff ha dealing with multiple things at the same time, that's what you want to preserve. That ability to understand the order of your code as best as possible. Now that said, let me look at the time analysis. If I have my kitchen robot doing this, this is not good. It's going to cook the fish, right? And it's just going to wait and do nothing else while the fish is cooking. It will literally just stare at the oven for 20 minutes and then return and then I have my fish, right? And then it calls cook rice and returns back and I get my starch. And so the, the overall is just too long. It takes almost an hour where I, human being, can do it in 30 minutes. And that's the difference between a, a, what a function and what we'll get to, a coroutine. A function, you call it, it does everything, and then it returns control. But when you're cooking with recipes, recipes look like functions, but when you get to a point where you don't have to do anything, like you're just staring at the oven, you'll pop out of thinking about that recipe being an intelligent human being, and then go to a different one. So recipes, unlike functions, you can return control to something else and then come back to it later and finish. That's the, what coroutines buy you. You can write down phone func code that looks like functions, but the order in which things are, are done is not sequential, and you can take advantage of times when you're just waiting on stuff to happen. Um, and then finally, one thing that I should bring up is the difference between parallelism and concurrency. And if you wanted parallelism, uh, I'm not selling it here. We're not going. Parallelism is doing multiple things at the same time. It's when it's where if you have two CPU cores, you do it both. And in the cooking metaphor, you would need parallelism if you had a lot of work to do. Like if I wanted to chop dozens and dozens of onions, I need help. I need another CPU core, i.e., you know family member or friend to come chop onions with me and we can get it done twice as fast. Concurrency is just dealing with multiple things going on at the same time. I can call my brother to help me chop dozens of onions and we can get it done twice as fast. <coughs> Cooking the salmon dinner, I don't need to call him. I, all I need to be able to do is switch between tasks intelligently so while one is in a waiting state, I can work on something else. So, so that's what we're doing, and that's why this works well with I.O., where there's a ton of waiting. CPUs are extremely fast. Uh, uh, gigaflot, billions of floating point operations per second. That is, billions of mathematical calculations can be performed every second. A CPU can get a lot done. But there are fundamental constraints on how fast we can do networking. If I want to uh, send a message to France, I'm limited by the speed of light. Uh, I cannot send a message to France faster than, I think it's about 40 milliseconds. So a round trip, if I want to do some I.O. across the Atlantic, that's 80 milliseconds. That's almost a tenth of a second right there. And in reality, it's, it's more like a, a latency of maybe 150 or 200 milliseconds. Okay, any questions about concurrency in general um, or about what we want, or about what you we hope to achieve with a coroutine. That is, a coroutine is like a function, it's like a subroutine, except instead of just calling it, it runs and then it returns, you call it, it will return control when it's waiting, and you can go back to it later. <coughs> okay, so, so for this section, we wanna understand the coroutine syntax in Python, understand how they're run, and see uh, what the li libraries are available for scheduling coroutines. Okay. So what I want to do is make some, again, rather pointless and silly functions uh, to serve as examples. So uh, I'm going to create a module called byhand.py. And in this, I'll import time, because I want the sleep function. And I'm going to make a function for squaring two numbers. This is a very simple function to write. All I have to do is return x times x. But I want to do a little, I want this function to be verbose and slow. So when it begins, it will say what it's doing. 
it will say it's starting the square function for whatever its argument was, x. Then let's go to sleep for a good three seconds. Oops. And then we'll say we're finishing. And let's do one more. One where we cube a number, that is multiply it by itself three times. We'll go to sleep for three seconds. And in order to cube things, one thing, one way I could do that is I could call the square function, right? And then I could just take that result and multiply it by x again. Take it nice and slow here. I'm glad no one's left yet because I know this has been <laughs> because they're by I promise you we're about to get into the cool new syntax and turn these into coroutines. Okay, I think I I'm going to go ahead and run this. Let's cube a number. There we go. See it called square. Now that has to do its thing. All right. That's the cube of 5 is 125. Now that's a function. It takes its argument. It's, you call it. It runs. And then it returns its value. It cannot, you can't stop it and come back to it later. So what I want to do is take this square function and turn it into a coroutine function. So here's the part. If you don't apply Python 3.5, you're about to, you'll, you'll get an error. A coroutine function is defined by async def, a regular function just by def. So now square is a coroutine function. Now this isn't going to work, but let's see how it breaks. So what do I do with the coroutine function? I could try calling it. And I do not get 16. I get back coroutine object square at some memory address. And this is the key difference. When you call a function in Python, it instantiates an in, it creates an instance of that function with the parameters you gave it. It runs the function and it returns to you the result. When you call a coroutine function, it creates an instance of that coroutine with your parameters, and then it just hands it back to you. It does not run it. It just makes the coroutine and gives it to you. So we should. So let's, uh, let's assign that to something so we can work with it. OK, so now uh, Coro is our coroutine object that we got when we called square with the argument for. So the question is, how do you run a coroutine? And this is the part where, in actual practice, you won't have to do this, but we're running these things by hand. If you want to run a coroutine by hand, you call it send method. This is used to communicate with the scheduler. We're going to send it none. And that's interesting. It did its thing, right? It executed the code, the suite of instructions. 
Uh, and then it raised a stop iteration exception. And in that exception is the value. So if you really wanted to do this, you'd have to catch that stop iteration exception and then get your 16 back. So far, so good? OK. Let's try calling cube and see what happens. OK. Yeah, anyone care to explain why that, what happened here? I'll say it, okay. <laughs> um, it says type error, unsupported multiplication operand for types coroutine and int. Let's take a look at the code and see what's wrong with this. Here, we said y equals square x. Well, what happens when you call a coroutine function? You get back a coroutine object. So uh, why is the coroutine object? It is not the number, because we never ran the coroutine. So that didn't work. And in general, you don't run a, a coroutine from a function. You can delegate or, in effect, call and run a coroutine from another coroutine. So what we need to do is change cube into a coroutine. And now, will this work? No. Yeah. And the reason it's no work is we're still, we're making a coroutine object here, and we say y equals square x. We need for this thing to make the coroutine object and, in effect, run those instructions and then get the result back. And the way that a coroutine runs another coroutine, delegates to it, lets it run, and takes its return value, is with the await. Uh, <clears throat> the statement, uh, the, it's, is it a keyword yet? Um, well, to be a keyword, await. Um, so when you await on another coroutine, it creates the instance, it runs it, and then it gives you the result. Now, this is a little different than follow, calling a function because it's possible that in the middle of running, it will stop and let, the, and let something else take over. We haven't gotten to how it does that, but we're almost there. Any questions? Okay, let's try it now. Oops. Remember, calling a coroutine gives you a coroutine object, so we'll assign that to that. To corp <coughs> <coughs> and then to run the coroutine, we'll send it none. And you see it ran square. So coroutines run other coroutines by awaiting on them and get the result. And then ultimately, the result was handed back to us in this uh, stop iteration exception, which was raised when it was done. So far, this is not very useful. Um, we haven't gone over how to actually, how the coroutine could do what it really is supposed to do, which is in the middle of what it's doing, send back control. So when it's sleeping, what we want it to do is just return to us, let us do something else, and then call it back in three seconds rather than just blocking everything for three seconds. That's what it's doing now. It's, call, it's blocking everything for three seconds. We want it to still wait three seconds, but we want to be able to do something else while it's waiting. And so I'm not going to explain this. You need a special co type of coroutine um, that actually interacts with the schedule, with the, the schedule that runs these coroutines. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this import time. And we're going to make a new sleep a special sleep coroutine. Um, this, is, this is what's called a generator-based coroutine. And unless you plan on writing a library like AsyncIO, unless you want to write your own scheduler, you don't have to understand this. But we need to do it. Um, to make this uh, tutorial work. OK. 
Okay. What this special coroutine will do when it's called is it will yield control back to whatever's running the coroutines. And it will tell it to call, to start me back up in however many seconds. So I'm going to change these time dot sleeps to a wait on a manual sleep. And I'm calling it manual sleep because we are a manual scheduler. We're scheduling coroutines uh, by ourselves. Yeah, so this is, um, right, the manual sleep is a generator, if you're familiar with Python generators. That decorator changes some flags in the code object to allow it to work with coroutines, with native coroutines. Um, and this is, this, is a, this is something you need to know if you're building a scheduler. We're going to use a scheduler from the standard library that provides all that for us. So when you're typically in an application writing code routines, you would never need to do that. All right, so far so good. Should we try it? So I'll make a code routine object. And then I'm going to run it. And look. I don't have to wait. It returned control back to me and gave me the value, this string that says, please call me back in three seconds. Well, I've used up my three seconds talking, so I should call it back. So I'm going to send it none again to start it back up so it can continue on its way doing its work. It delegated, it awaited on the square coroutine, which awaited on the sleep, which returned control to me so I can keep talking. Again, I've used up the three seconds talking, so let's let it continue. And now it finishes. So far, so good. So here's the real magic. Here's what I can do. I can do coroutine one equals cube two, and I could do coroutine two equals cube ten. I can start running coroutine one. Okay, well now it's waiting, so what can I do? I can get coroutine 2 running because I have, I'm able to So now coroutine 1 and coroutine 2 have done some work. They're both, in, they're both waiting to be called back. I'll call row coroutine 1 back. It's been three seconds. I'll call coroutine 2 back. You know. And you could see I had, I had both these coroutines doing stuff concurrently. And what happens is when the coroutine gets in a state where it's waiting for something to happen, in this case just waiting for three seconds to elapse, it lets me do something else. I'm the scheduler and I can run all these coroutines. So far so good. Okay, so you would never, you never actually have to call send when you're writing applications. You use a scheduler library, which does all of that for you. Um, let me go back to the slides. Oops. Oh, the slides are out of order, I apologize. There are a number of scheduler libraries available in Python which run coroutines for you and provide a lot of operations. Uh, one of the most well-known and well-established one is Twisted. And Twisted is really uh, the the sort of grandparent of all these ideas. A lot of, uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the syntax itself, in Py not the syntax, but the ideas of how this works in Python owe themselves to this development. And Twisted is still well maintained today and supports the new syntax. One we'll look at is AsyncIO, because this is, this is the standard library. There's a commitment from the Python community to support this. As of Python 3.6, it is a, um, 
It is no longer provisional. It's a full member of the Python standard library. You install Python, you get async IO for free. Um, it does predate the modern coroutines, and it has some additional abstraction layers for doing things like callbacks. And then there's some other new libraries that I'm, I'd like to mention. Curio is a newer library with a simple design just based on the, uh, the new features of Python 3.5 and focusing on coroutines alone. Um, and, and similarly, there's one called Trio. And my apologies to everyone else who's uh, writing cool schedulers and I haven't mentioned you or has written them in the past. Okay, so with that, let's change this to something that uses async IO. So I'm going to delete out this manual thing. And I'll import async IO. One thing async IO comes with is a sleep coroutine. And notice now these, now the code that I've written is sort of bound up to, it's, it's async, now what I've written has become async IO specific code. I think one thing that people, uh, a misconception that's been happening is that async and await have to use async IO. They're features of the language itself, and you can use all these variety of schedulers. But once you start using the coroutine specific to async IO in your code, um, then aside from some compatibility efforts, your code is now, uh, is now uh, specific to that scheduler. Okay, so how do I use async IO? Well, um, the scheduler for async IO is called the event loop. So I make a call to async IO, get event loop to get uh, uh, <coughs> a reference to that loop. And now, if I want to run the, and now I can take a coroutine, I can make a coroutine object. And I run until complete. What it does is it's a function. I give it a coroutine object, and it will run the scheduler until that coroutine object has completed running uh, and give me the return value. And then it will stop the scheduler again. And there we go. So far, so good, but we're missing the big key thing, right? We want to be able to run multiple of these at the same time, or have them started up and running concurrently. That is, they're all going on. Um, and the scheduler's running multiple ones of them and while it's waiting. Um, there, is, there is a method, there is a coroutine function in async IO called gather. And what this does is it takes coroutine objects as arguments. And it returns you a, co a, a coroutine that when you run it, it will run, it will run all of the ones you gave it concurrently. So, for example, I'll give it. Okay, so now group is a coroutine that will cause all three of these to be run by the scheduler concurrently. So if I call, um, if I call run until complete on this coroutine, this should run them all concurrently, and you can see that the scheduler is doing its job. It's, and now it returns to me a list of the cubes of these three numbers. Yes, it's a good question. It's in the order you, uh, you, you pass them together. Yeah. 
What order they actually execute in, I do not believe that's, there's any guarantee. So they could be executed in any order, which one finishes first. And you could kind of see this. It started one, then it did three, then it did two. But your responses are in the order that you gave them. It's, it's in the order you, you pass them. Yeah, so you, you don't get any guarantees on who finishes first, but by, by specifying the order of the arguments, you specify what order you get back. Yeah, otherwise it'd be a mess, right? <laughs> how, could, how could you use this? Um, okay, so that's the basic syntax. But there's a couple more pieces of basic Python syntax uh, that I need to talk about to, to sort of complete uh, uh, this. And so let me go back to normal iterators. Like, hopefully we're, you know, for loops are pretty standard, but I want to go into how for loops really work. You have a container, and what a for loop does is it, call, it actually calls a special method on that container object to return something called an iterator. And it takes that iterator and it calls a special method called next that gives you an item and then it executes the code below in this do stuff, right, in the suite of instructions. <clears throat> and that's a function call. What would be useful in terms of asynchronous IO is you could imagine a container that's not really a list or a tuple or a dictionary, but it actually in order to fetch things, it has to make a database call. So in that process of fetching items, it's calling out to the network. And in this case, we want to do that asynchronously. While it's doing that, we want to be able to yield control back to the scheduler and let something else run while we're waiting. And for this, there's asynchronous iterators. So if you have a special container that's an asynchronous iterator, you can use this uh, syntax async4. That will only work on an asynchronous container. And what it does is every time you call something, you call something called a next, and instead of giving you a met, instead of running a function, it returns a coroutine that the scheduler will run. So the important thing to know that if you have to use async4, every time you get to the top of that loop, your code may contr return controls to the scheduler and allow other things to run while the next item is being fetched. Any questions on that? Right. Well, yeah, one thing, though, it's this, this is a sequential in that if I'm a coroutine doing an async4, it's happening one after the other. So, so I'm not, I'm not, yeah. Okay. Second thing is context managers, and these are really useful. The way a context manager works is when you say with manager as M, the manager object, it calls an enter method upon entering the block, which could do cool things like if you use file open, it can open files, set up network connections, and give you back an object M that you can use to do stuff with it. And then when you exit this indented block of code, or if you raise an exception, this exit method is going to eventually be called to clean things up. And so here, in the context of asynchronous I.O., when you set up the network connection and when you clean it up, we don't want that to block. We want those to be coroutines so you can yield back control to the scheduler. And that's what the, the syntax async with is for. It's, you have to have a special context manager which, is, which, which, ha which has these other special methods which will give you a coroutine back which will be run. So the important thing is if you have a asynchronous context manager, when you enter that block of code and when you leave, you may return control back to the scheduler and allow other things to run. Um, and that's the basic syntax. One feature of this whole system is that when you look at a coroutine, um, and this is, if you're familiar with threads at all, this is a very different thing from programming the threads. You know, looking at your coroutine, something about the order of execution. Unless there's an async for, an async with, or an await, 
your code is going to execute in the order you see it. It's only when you await that, that some the scheduler will allow other things to run. It's cooperative in that sense. So it can make understanding the order of execution and the safety of your code a little bit simpler. Um, because you know when, when other things might happen around you and when you know when the order of your code happens as it's written. So uh, there's a couple more things to really be able to use async IO that you need to know. I think we've, we've seen some of them. One is the gather command, uh, uh, the gather method, which you pass a number of coroutine objects, and it will give you the results in a list. Uh, we've seen async IO get event loop. That gives you the event loop, and then you can run methods on that event loop. Uh, we've seen run until complete. Um, run. There's three more things I'd like to go over briefly. Um, just because this set forms like the minimal things I think that as a, as a novice, one should know when actually using this. Um, but I'd like to, uh, let me first go back to gather. One thing about gather that you might ask is what happens if something throws an exception? So let's make that happen. What I'm going to do is change the square coroutine to just fail if you give it 7. All right, so the square function coroutine here will admit that it's not really all that good at its job. Um, it doesn't know how to square seven. Um, So, <clears throat> so if I want to run a lot of these, Let's see what happens. What happened is we didn't get anything back um, except for an exception. That uncaught exception um, was, was the only thing returned. You could change that behavior if you want to when you're running gather. So let's make another group of coroutines. Um, you can call gather Um, with the keyword argument, return exceptions and set it to true. If you do that, if any of the coroutines being run concurrently raises an exception, it'll come back to you in the list of results. Okay, so let's, we have a new group of coroutine objects and we'll run this. What the heck? Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah, so now you can see it was able to do five, six, and it returned the, uh, the actual exception object. So that's something if you, if you want to just blow up, you can blow up, let things blow up. If you want exceptions to be returned so you can get the values of the things that actually worked, you could do that too.
Oh, there's a, um, if you see, uh, here we go. When I, when I called gather, I gave it a keyword argument, return exceptions equals true. And Um, did I? Wait. All right. Um, I'm wondering, let's see, if in the interest of time. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to come back to uh, create task and running executor if we have time. Let me say one thing about run forever. Run forever just makes the run event loop run forever. The way to stop that is to have a coroutine that calls loop stop. So you can run a loop forever when you, when you want coroutines to continue executing until they decide it's time, for, it's time to shut down. Um, create task returns to a task object, which you can use to, uh, you can use to uh, potentially you can wait on when that task is done, that, that task being a scheduled coroutine that's running. You can check its result. Um, you, can, you can cancel it. Run an executor is something for legacy code. If you have a piece of blocking IO, a blocking IO function, you can run it in executor, and what it will do is launch a thread to run it separately so the scheduler can still run a asynchronous IO without that um, interfering. Okay, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to skip a couple examples because I want to get to the important part, the meaningful part. How do we do actual I.O.? Sleeping's great, but it gets boring after a while. Um, so async I.O. Pr provides uh, two different APIs, one called streams and one called transport protocol for socket programming. This is a no I'm trying to make this a novice tutorial, so I don't think we <laughs> I'd rather not get into socket programming. It's not in scope. So, but the thing is, what you could do is rather than using that sockets layer, there's lots of third-party add-on uh, libraries for popular application protocols. And a lot of them are contained in the AIO libs pro uh, project. For example, there's AIO HTTP for doing HTTP requests. It it's, has a syntax that's very similar to the popular requests library. It also has a web server with a framework that's kind of Flask-like. And you can see there's other ones. I like AIO Redis because I like to use Redis. <coughs> um, there's MySQL, so on, and you can visit. Let's do some stuff with AIO HTTP and go back to where we started, the animals example. Animals and AIO HTTP. I lost my notes, so we really have to live code this. Um, let's go back to the animals thing we uh, wrote. And so for this, you will need AIO HTTP installed. And what I want to do is rewrite this so that it, um, it uses coroutines and uses AIO HTTP to make all these requests concurrently, so we don't have to wait another five seconds for every uh, for every animal sound. We can get them all, you know, in the same in a in a group. Okay, so first thing I'll do is I'm going to, ch let me start from the main routine and change it back. So I'm going to make this to a coroutine. We'll have a list of animals. Now instead of making a session object, I'm going to use an asynchronous context manager. 
And before I do that, let's make a list of, let's create an empty list to put our coroutines in. And then I'm going to do async with AIO. And this is how you get a session in AIO HTTP. It looks kind of annoying in request. You could just say request session and assign it to something. Why do we need an asynchronous context manager? That's so when we're setting up the session and tearing it down, doing any cleanup, that's done asynchronously and the scheduler can still run other things should it need to. Okay. So I need to indent this a little more and change uh, what I'm doing. So for each animal in the animals, I will get a coroutine. I will call the speak coroutine uh, function, which we'll have to go back and with the animal in the session. We'll go back and turn speak into a coroutine. And let's append that to our list. Um, you could use a list comprehension. I decided not to just keep things simple in terms of syntax. Okay. Okay, and then we'll run all those coroutines concurrently. Um, and then to pass a list, you don't pass a list to gather, you pass several arguments, so we'll use the splat. <coughs> if you're not familiar with the splat, you may not be. I think I was doing Python for years before I finally figured it out. Um, what it does is if you put an asterisk be in front of a function parameter, it takes that list or any sort of iterable and explodes it out into one argument for each item in the list. Okay. Oops. And then we'll just iterate through those responses and print each line. Okay, so that's that's the main routine. Any questions while people are still typing? Why does? Ah, you're right. Okay, I. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, very, yeah. I had indented this wrong. You're right. Okay, so I was wondering, like, how did this ever work? Um, no, you're absolutely right. This would not have run because the session goes away once you get out of that width. Um, yeah, and all these coroutines would be talking, it would be uh, having, having a session that expired. Good question. Any other questions? Sorry about that. Okay, let's go and fix up speak so that it's a coroutine. So we'll change it to async def. And here it's a little different too than how you get. When you do a request in, with AHIOHDP, the refer, preferred way to make that request is as a, an asynchronous context manager. Um, the reason for doing this, rather than just sort of awaiting on it, is that um, an HTTP response can, can do things like stream. Once you get the status code, there's, you, could, you, might, you might want to you know, get the initial response and then do other things and then get the body of the response. So, and then the other difference here is that 
Text is not an attribute of an AIO HTTP response. It's a method. I mean, it's a coroutine method, so you have to await on it. Okay, right, yeah, that's a good question. Async, when you, async I gather uh, returns a coroutine object. I used run until complete because that's the, that's the coroutine I wanted the loop to run until it was done. If I'm calling a gather from within a coroutine, you'll wait on it. Um, so for example, what I'm gonna do is, oops, I need to go to the top. I also need to import, um, we'll need to import async IO because at the bottom here, if we want to run this, um, what I need to do so yeah, when I do run until complete, that main coroutine object will be scheduled, and when it's done, the loop will terminate. I could, I could, I have to have some coroutine to, that for the loop to run on. I have to, I have to schedule something. But once main is scheduled, when, when the main coroutine object awaits, that automatically, th those are automatically scheduled as objects that are delegated to. I don't, sorry I'm not, coming up with a better answer to the question. Oh. oh, good question. Yeah, I think I did. I got rid of the main because now we can't just, yeah, if we just called main, we'd be having, we'd be sitting here with the coroutine object. We need to get this, we need to get the event loop and pass main to, to uh, run until complete to have it actually run the coroutine. Exactly, yeah. And you can also schedule with create task. So, yeah, if you're not in a, if you're in a coroutine, you can await on other coroutines to get them moving and then get the result. If you're not in a coroutine, you can't await. So there has to be some mechanism to get the ball rolling. So if you're in a function, you can, you can cause a coroutine to be scheduled with create task, or you could do run until complete, which will schedule the coroutine, and it will run the event loop run whatever coroutines it has scheduled until that one's done. Okay, so let's run it and see if uh, I messed up. There we go. Get all the responses at once. We caused the uh, web service to uh, uh, check out the cow, the pig, and the chicken concurrently. Mm hmm Yes. Um, okay, so I believe on yeah, I believe there's in principle there's implementation dependence. For any TCP IP network IO it's it's going to use i it's not it doesn't need to use threads it can use a uh, a select call on sockets so under the hood i'm 99.9% .9 certain it's single threaded and it's using it's using a select now on uh linux or on linux or i think any posix system if you want to do asynchronous file io under the hood it has to it has to fire up a thread there's no way around it but for network io yeah the basic network IO with sockets, it's using, it's doing select calls underneath with a single thread. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's, and this is a good point. There's, there, there's, there's, 
you can you can do things with multi-threading. There's things you can get into where you have multiple. There's reasons why you might want multiple event loops to be run, um, and that can cause this. This has been improved in 3.6. When you do, you know, async I/O get event loop, that gives you the default event loop. In some context, you have to be careful about which event loop you're getting. Um, did someone else have a question that I skipped over? Apologize. Okay. Okay, so this is why can you not call close? You can, um, yeah, calling close. I have it. I didn't. I didn't put it here, but I put it in the typed examples. T calling close. You should do when the after the scheduler has stopped running, and once you call close, it's done. You can never start it back. You can never start that event loop back up. It will fully clean up. Um, so that's a cleanup method. So it doesn't. It doesn't make sense to call close within a coroutine. Right. Oh, oh yeah. Um, as far as I understand, um, async IO get event loop is, does not support context management. Is that, does that answer it? Oh, why, yeah, why can you not use get event loop as a context manager? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I, I have to think about, like, if that would, yeah, in that context, maybe, it, maybe a context manager makes sense. I don't know. Um, it, ha it hasn't been written yet, so. <laughs> Um, yes, and let's look at the docs. Oh, sorry, yeah. Can you, is there a way to get multiple event loops? Is there a way to get different event loops? If you wanted to have multiple loops running, you know, is there a way to get a second and have different named loops? Um, I believe there is an argument to that, and I have to... Um, let's see. Now, I think if you're if you're in like a different thread and you call get event loop, you okay? So where is it? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit my own ignorance. I do not remember how to do this offhand. And I'm not 100% sure I ever knew how to do this, but I want to believe I did, but I can't remember how to do that. Yeah, there, there are contexts in which that makes sense. Um, like, I, so for example, you could have a multi-threaded web server where you have eight CPU cores. You want one event loop running on you, because this is a single-threaded idea, so you want one asynchronous worker running on each thread. But you want some shared state, so you want it to be a single process. So that'd be one example. There are much better examples that I don't know. Um. Okay, so, oops, yeah. A couple of words of caution. When you make <laughs> lots of concurrent Request make sure the server that you're you know when you make five you now have the power to make 500 requests at once and not wait for the results to come back. So you could do things like pushing all the buttons on the elevator, um, and so make sure whatever web service you're connecting to and giving 100 requests at the same time expects to handle that sort of load or that's that's uh, an approved way of using it. Um, and, and, and it, there's also some interesting things you can get into what's called back pre the need for back pressure. Asyn making asynchronous calls like this, you're telling something else to start doing something and not waiting for it to get done. 
So you could give it more work than it can handle very easily, and it may need a way to tell you, I can't handle any more work, or it will fall over. Um, so the next piece of this um, was to take the server side. Um, I was reluctant to do this as I run this successful enterprise service. With the <laughs> but as this is in the spirit of open source, I figure I should open source a rudimentary version of the, of the, of the cloud speak and say. So um, just as an example, here's how you can use um, AI or HTTP for your server. So we'll make this actual animal API uh, service. Okay, oops, I went too fast with that, I apologize. So I'm gonna make a module called Web Service Animals. And this is gonna be a web server which can handle incoming requests concurrently. What's nice about this is I can have one single threaded worker that can still handle several uh, dozens of requests coming in before they're completed because when it's starting one, handling one request coming in, that will be a coroutine and it can just schedule another for each request. The worker doesn't have to wait for one request to finish and return before it can start work on the next one. Okay, so I will need the sleep method. And I'm gonna import um, the web method uh, from AIO HTTP, which I can use to make a server. Now I'll make a dictionary called the farm, and I'm not gonna give away all of my secrets, but I will let you know what a couple of the animals say. You have to subscribe to the service to get all of them and the premium animals. Um, no, but you can add them to your farm dictionary on your local web server. I should at least have llamas. I mean, yeah, I think you could get the llamas and the alpacas are on the five dollar a month tier. If you want like the Komodo dragons and uh, you know certain salamanders, you got to go up to the twenty five tier. Um, let me make a very simple hello world request handler. So a request handler on this server is written this way. It's a coroutine function. So, um, so this is our handler. So we'll make this, and we'll get to the animals later, but when someone connects to this web service with just the, uh, we'll, we'll have it return to them the text, welcome to the farm. Um, and you notice that this handler is a coroutine. So this web service, even though it's a single threaded one worker, can handle multiple incoming requests coming in concurrently before the first one is even finished. Okay, so here's how you make an app. Uh, we make an application object. We will add a get method to the animals route. And that get method will call our hello coroutine function. And then you call web run app on your app 
on your web application, and that will run a server. Uh, the AI HTTP server documentation has some good, more complex examples. Um, so far, so good. Can I do it? All right. So if I call this, it will run on port 8080. So I'm going to go to another terminal. Uh, is everyone not, anyone familiar with curl? You can also use your browser. Um, you, could, you could type this into your browser, or use curl, or use Python requests. And there it goes. Welcome to the farm. So far, so good. Oops. Yeah. OK, I'm going to stop this now and add another handler. which will actually give you what the animal says. So uh, to get the name from the URL, we'll call animal. The request object that's passed to the coroutine function has a match info, which will uh, get the name. If the animal is not in our farm, let's return let's give them a 404 not found. You can set the status. No, you're right. Thank you. No, it's not. It's not a new Python for you. That is a syntax error. Um, okay, right. We want to return a response object that the server will then handle and hand to the client. But if the animal is in the farm, we'll await on async IO sleep for five seconds giving that artificial. And if this was a real serious web service here, this would be some database connection, right? We'd be doing some complex query that took like 10 seconds to do. And, and we don't want to clog up this web server, too. OK, and we can return a response, which is just the text of, we will fetch the animal from the farm dictionary. And that's it. Um, but we've got to add the route. So um, here's the, we have to create a resource. And then we'll add a get method. Oops, no, sorry, add route. No, 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 no. Sorry, I did that wrong. And for that resource, we'll add the route for the get method, which we'll call the speak handler.
that's a oh if you if you forget the await let's let's do that after we run it yeah yeah that's a good enough question so the question is what if we forgot to write await there what if we just wrote sleep and that's um, that's such a good question that I want to go and run this when everyone's done typing and then go back to it. Um, Um, I think we need to use the resource um, in order to um, to have that name that we can pass into the handler. Right, exactly. It's the parameterized URL. I don't think you can do a parameterized URL with add get. There may be a way to do it, but it wasn't in the in the documentation, or I didn't see it in the documentation. Okay. So with that added, let's go ahead and run it. And it said moo. Um, one thing, let's go up. I'm going to go to another terminal. And look, this web server can handle multiple requests at the same time even though it has a single worker because it's it's executing those coroutines concurrently so it can handle more than one request at a time it can work with multiple ones simultaneously or concurrently uh, let me go back and make mess this up so the question was what if we forgot to await that sleep object. We just said sleep five. Sleep calling sleep five makes a coroutine object, right? So, because sleep five is a sleep is a coroutine function, calling a coroutine function just makes the coroutine object. You have to await it to actually run it. So, in this expression, we make the coroutine object and then we just throw it away. So, this is going to instantiate a sleep coroutine object and then do nothing with it. So what we expect to happen is that it's not actually going to sleep. It's nothing's actually going to schedule. That, that coroutine object will never be scheduled. It's never awaited. And this will just return. So I'll go here. See, now it's instantaneous because that coroutine is not. We're making the coroutine object and just throwing it out. Yeah. Another good question. Um, let me quit out of this. Okay. Ah, okay. So th th this is a pitfall. If you forget to await, if you forget to write await and you just call a coroutine, you won't actually delegate to it and run it. Okay, so what if we just use time sleep? This is a great question that gets to the fact that this is all cooperative multitasking. If your coroutine does something for a long time and does not return control to the scheduler, nothing can run. So this would be, yeah, this would be a big mistake. When you call time sleep, you're telling the kernel to shut, to, to put your whole thread to sleep. So that, that all this stuff is just one thread. If, if you call time sleep, the scheduler can't, it never wakes up. So um, let's run it using time sleep. So watch this. If I get cow and I get chicken, I get moo, you notice this has taken longer than five seconds. That's because it was, while it was waiting on the cow to say moo, it wasn't able to, uh, to wake up and handle chicken concurrently, it was completely asleep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and that's the problem. If you accidentally insert blocking regular IO, you could you could block the whole thing down. Or if you just do too much computation for too long, you can you can make it to where no other coroutine has a chance to run. If you're doing heavy computation and you want to say, okay, I'm taking a long time to actually do work. I want to let other coroutines one, you could do async IO sleep zero. Sleep zero will return control to the schedule, scheduler, but have you called back as soon as possible. 
this is a nice thing to do. It lets other stuff run. Um, let me put back up the code just in case anyone else was typing. Um, yeah, oops. Yeah, so let's fix it. Let's change it back to... Yes, these are so these are good questions. So we're running we're running low on time. Maybe we're yeah we're running a little low on time. And I forgot to give you all a break. I apologize. I've never done a format. I've never uh, given any sort of presentation or talk over 70 minutes. I used to do 70 minute labs when I taught high school physics, but 110 minutes is sort of new to me. So, <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, what's a good way to communicate between coroutines? And I was going to, I think we may, we could try doing this, but we may run out of time, do a streaming web service where you publish and subscribe, where you could do a get call and you will subscribe to something and other people can post messages. Um, that's a queue. Queues are fantastic and they're a great way of communicating between coroutines. Um, they're also great if you walk out of here and you say, you know what, I don't want to use async IO, I'd rather use threads. That's fine. There's a threading, there's a queue object for threads as well for multiprocessing. No matter how you're doing um, concurrent or even parallel programming, this is a very useful um, object. Um, so a queue is, a, is an or effectively an order list of items. Uh, one coroutine could put items on a queue, and another one could take them off after they've been added. And this is usually a safe way to communicate in that these operations of putting something onto a queue or taking it off are atomic. It doesn't get screwed up by different threads or different processes or different coroutines uh, running. Um, async IO queues are implemented in the following way. So if you want to make a queue, you say queue equals async IO queue. You could give it a max size keyword. It defaults to zero. If you, if you give it zero, that means you could put as much stuff on the queue as you have memory for. If you give it a max size, then it won't let you put more than that many items on. It has two coroutine functions, and this is cool. Q.get gets the last item off the queue, gets the, you know, the first, the last item, sorry, gets the uh, item that was added first to the queue. Um, but if there's nothing on the queue, it will wait and return to the scheduler. So you could do a Q.get um, you can loop over queue.get and just wait for messages. So you can have a, a coroutine that has a queue and that can, can loop, uh, uh, can have a loop, can call queue.get, and if there's nothing there, it will just let other things run until it's time. Yeah. Exactly. Um, there's the put. You put an item on the queue. It could be any Python object. Um, and again, this is, uh, oops, way to full. Yeah, it should be way to full. Uh, so this is a coroutine. If the queue is full, if you've set a max size, then it will just wait until there's room. So that's, that's nice, too. Now, if you don't feel like waiting, you can do a get no wait, which will get, and that's a regular function. So that will not return control to the scheduler. It will get an item, or if there's nothing in the queue, it will raise an exception. There's also a put no wait, which will put an item on the queue or raise an exception if the queue is full. Um, and let's see, I think we have 15 minutes. I think we can do this. Um, Do you, the question is, do you not have to do task done like on a thread queue worker? Um, I, I either don't, I don't think I fully understand or, and or I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah. Okay.
Yeah, I think depending on what your worker model is, you may need to do some sort of cleanup. Uh, but the Q object itself, to my knowledge, there's no, there's no cleanup required. Um, there, there are some met let's see, there are some additional methods that I didn't, um, that I didn't put on here, but they're in the documentation that I think can aid in that sort of. If you need, if you, if your model requires that, um, there's some, there's some additional methods that that may be of interest. Right. Yeah, it's all within one thread. Yeah, I. Yeah, to my knowledge, you, yeah, you can put any any object in it. Um, um, so here's a streaming web service, and this is a great. I think streaming stuff is is um, a, a great example of where this sort of programming is extremely useful um, because you have a lot of connections that are just waiting around. So you can imagine a web service where people do a get, it opens a streaming connection, and then they just, uh, you know, they just wait. Like maybe you're waiting for Twitter messages or stock prices to change. So the client will just sit on an open connection and wait for text to come in. Um, and so what we'll do is make another endpoint where you could send a message to post. So the idea is we, have lot, we can have lots of clients that have opened, that have done a get request and opened that connection and left it open. And then when someone does a post, that message will go to all of our clients. Oops. Okay. So, <clears throat> so I'll make a new module called PubSub. You can call it what you want. We'll import async IO. Okay. So to have a publication and subscription model, I need to think what is a subscription? A subscription will be a queue. So if a when a client does a get, we'll create a queue for them, and that will be their subscription and the publisher will throw a message on that queue. So we'll, well first I'm going to make a, uh, a helper class called a hub. This hub will be the hub of all uh, subscriptions. And in its init, um, I'm going to give it one attribute. And that's going to be an empty set. And what this is going to be allowed me to do is that when we do a get request, that handler will make a queue object, and it will add it to that set of subscriptions. It will. And then the cool thing about a set is you could call the remove method when you want to unsubscribe and take that queue off of the set. Um, Um, this helper class will have a method, a publish method, which will take a message and put it on all of the queues. So each queue is a subscriber. We'll put the message on every queue. And we're going to have these queues be unlimited side. You notice I'm going to do a put and await function. So none of this, there's no awaits here. That means while it's looping over these queues, you don't have to worry about anything else running in the middle of that, right? This, will, this function will not yield back to the scheduler. While it's doing this, nothing else runs. So we don't have to necessarily worry about any side effect, anything messing with anything while we're in the process of looping through those. I think that would be okay anyway, but um, uh, 
um, I need another helper class, which is going to represent a subscription. I'm going to pass it the hub. And then that subscription is also going to have an async IOQ object. Let's make this a context manager, right? Oh, All right. Let's make this a context manager so that when you create it, you could create a subscription, be subscribed in your with block. And then as soon as you leave or you have an, it for any reason or raise an exception, we can clean up and take, remove this queue. Well, I'm going to make a special enter method. And that will just add the queue to the set of subscriptions. And then it will return the queue, so that um, so that the uh, uh, the code calling this context manager can can uh, take things off of it. Oops. And then for the exit, we're going to keep this simple. The exit method has to take for our uh, three additional arguments um, just because that's how it may be called when you exit if there's an exception. Um, okay, so. I'm going to make a singleton uh, hub object to be used application wide. And we'll make two, I'm going to make two handler methods. A subscribe method, when you make a get, when you make a get request, it's going to call subscribe. And this is going to use uh, the stream response. We'll set the header to for the content type. Um, this will just help some clients. We're going to set the status code to 200. This is successful. And then what you have to do is uh, await on a response prepare. And what this is actually doing um, is it, it's setting up, uh, it's actually sending this information to the client. Um, and now, now that you've got the response set up, the client will receive 200 and will be waiting for the body, which will be this text that continues to come. We can create a subscription, pass us our hub. And then we can loop forever. And we'll fit while we're looping. We'll await and, and get messages off the queue. Um, and then we will write to the response. Uh, 
Um, we have to change this. Um, we have to tag on a uh, carriage return line feed. That's an HTTP thing to know that so that will cause the client to uh, write it. This has to be converted to bytes. Um, and at the end, we'll return response, although we'll never really get here. Okay, and I'm going to apologize for going too fast. This example is on the examples GitHub. Uh, so now if I want to publish, I will get a message from the query string. I'll call publish on the hub. And then I'll return a response that just says OK. And then we just have to add these to our router. So We'll add the subscribe handler. Oops. As add get, thank you. Okay. Okay, so we'll run it. And let me start up one client here. Oops, ah, uh, I'm just messing with it. Uh oh. Wait. Huh? Um. Oh, is my URL correct? No. Um, oh, yeah, you're right. There we go. Okay. Um, now let me uh, send a message. It says okay. And you can see I got the message. And we can open up more clients. So you can open up more clients, and they'll also get the message. I have, okay. Let me open up one more tab. I'll create another client. And let's send, post another message to the, and there you can see this client got the message, and the new client also got the message. So it was added to both their queues, and then those coroutines pulled the, sorry? Oh yeah, here's here's sending the message with curl. I just uh, send a post with the query string uh, message equals bar. All right. Yeah, and so this this example is called exa uh, pub sub AO HTTP. Um, um, so you can look up. Uh, that's so. I think we're out of time. So thanks everyone. I hope this was useful and it made some sense out of the new syntax.